Hi, in this video I thought we'd have a look at another power supply and this time it's the Raiden 6006. So this is a relatively new power supply, I saw it on AliExpress about a month ago uh, and Banggood have sent this one to me to uh, do a review on and I thought this was quite an interesting device really because it's got a nice compact form factor. So you can see on the back here we've got all of the electronics and it takes a 6 to 70 volt DC input on the terminals here and then that gives you a 0 to 60 volt DC power supply. I think it's got 0 to 6 amps output capability providing that your power supply that you provide it power with is capable of providing that kind of power. And the idea is that you can either integrate this into your own caseworks, so you could have a whole bank of these if you needed them, or you can buy a specific case from Raiden and they do a sort of single height version and they do a double height as well if you want like a dual power supply situation. So I thought this was quite interesting. Let's have a little look at the listing on Banggood. Uh, it will show a little bit more what I'm talking about in terms of the caseworks. So here you can see the three parts of this sort of ecosystem and I'm pretty sure they do have a double height version that might be on the Raiden AliExpress shop. But here's the, power, uh, here's the power supply itself and it comes in two versions. So you've got the standard version that just has a USB interface. Then you've got another version which is I think $5 more which has a little add-on Wi-Fi communication board. And you can see we've got that here in the bag and I think that just plugs in at the bottom here. So this is currently selling for about $58 and then you've got the other devices as well. So first of all you've got the switching power supply which provides the conversion from the AC down to the 60 volts or 70 volts for the power supply unit itself. So that's $35, that's the recommended one. I think that's a mean well branded so uh, certainly no problems with that sort of power supply. And then you've got the casework itself which is coming in at $39. So if you add that up it's very similar in price to sort of one of the mid to higher end Chinese power supplies that you can buy on the likes of Banggood and AliExpress. But I think actually this is a, a much nicer unit and a little bit more configurable but, it's, but it certainly seems to have really quite a nice user interface. Now if we take a look at the specifications there's a PDF associated with the power supply. And you can see here it says input voltage range 6 to 70 volts, output voltage range 0 to 60. Now I'm not sure if it has a book boost type converter or whether the input voltage has to be higher than you want to output. So we'll find that out in a minute. Output current range 0 to 6 amps and 360 watts output capability. Most of the digital readouts have at least two decimal places. Uh, it's got three decimal places for the current uh, and the accuracy is 0.5% plus five digits, so that's pretty good. It's got a few extra little features that you don't normally get on power supplies, so capacity and energy measurement, and that's about it really. So uh, and it does say book mode, so the output voltage will not be able to exceed the incoming supply voltage, so uh, that answers that question. Right, so here's our test setup. So on the left-hand side here, we've got the Fluke 289 that's reading the output voltage, the Fluke 87 that's reading current. I've got a little MOSFET load off to the side here. The output from my PL303 power supply powering it. So we're outputting 60 volts. It is limited to 3 amps so we won't be able to try it at the full power. Um, and then we've got uh, some various in interconnects. I've got my brand new cables. Um, so I've mainly got shrouded 4mm connectors but I had to buy some unshrouded to uh, to do some of the testing on some upcoming videos so I bought a few of these, these were quite pricey. And basically what you can do is you can set the, the output voltage, so you press V set and then you can key in the voltage. So let's try 1.24 and press enter and then when we turn it on there we go we see 1.2456 that's fairly close to what it should be. Let's try it again, so 10 volts and 10.005, so that's pretty good. Let's try 50 volts and it's pretty quick getting there actually, I'm not sure if you're seeing, it looks like it's ramping up on this display but on the flute you're seeing it's just going straight there. Let's see if it will output 60 volts, I don't think it will quite, I think there'll be a little bit of voltage drop yeah, 55. 55 on the dot basically. 
Um, I'm not sure what we can go up to. Can we go up to 59? Yeah, so only uh, the input voltage only needs to be about a volt or so above the voltage that you want to set. Let's try it under load. So we'll drop it back down to something fairly reasonable. Oops. It takes a little bit of time to settle, so it's clearly got some output capacitance on the output here. And then if we turn on the load, I think I preset this to about 100 milliamps, so let's see. Yeah, so 0 0.98, 0 0.098, 980 milliamps, and we're reading about 99 milliamps on the Fluke 87. Let's dial it up a little bit should be 200 milliamps or so and again 198 198 and let's turn it right up to uh, a couple of amps here right so that was a little bit of a fail I had the uh, the lead in the milliamp jack so I think we're just blowing the 400 milliamp fuse once I pumped it up to two amps um, I've got it in the 10 amp now so I think that should remain unaffected so let's try reapplying the two amp or so load and there we go. So two amps and uh, basically two amps on here. We are seeing a little bit of voltage drop here. And uh, I think that is actually real. So I don't think we've got the sensing of the voltage on the terminals of the power supply. So we'll have a little look at that when we look at the PCBs. But I think that may be a potential problem. And I don't think there's any way to do a four wire, uh, you know, have the, the separate sense terminals going off to your circuit so that you can account for... Uh, lengths of wire and that kind of thing. So that's potentially a problem. Uh, we'll increase the current a bit further, uh, but that's about as far as I can go. So what's that? 3 amps at 10 volts. So, uh, I mean, the, the readings actually are correct. I think we just may have a problem with the implementation here. So what I'll do now is I'll just go and grab the oscilloscope and we can have a look at the behaviour when we start going into uh, current limiting mode. Right, so I think we've got everything in shot. We've got the scope connected up to the output. And what we're going to do is take a look at what the startup waveform looks like. So currently the load is not turned on. So this is just the general startup behavior. And we're going to turn it on at 8 volts just so it fits on the screen nicely. And right, so we get this sort of rise up here. And then it just slowly drops down and then settles to the final value. So you can see the little control loop in action here. The actual rise time from here to here is only 17.5 milliseconds and we get a slight overshoot of about 4%. So it just tops up a little bit over 8 volts and then settles back down. Let's try the same thing with a load connected and then if we turn it on again Here you can see the actual rise time has actually extended, so uh, it's just moved to the left here. Total rise time of about 50 milliseconds. Still a very slight overshoot here, so this is saying about 3.8% overshoot, and then it settles down to the final value. Right, so now let's see how it handles going into constant current mode when it's already settled at a higher voltage. So this is a 12 volt lamp that I'm applying. And here you can see it quite smoothly transitions down. There's a little bit of undershoot there, and then it settles quite nicely at 12.3 volts. Let's test adding a additional load to that. And there we get a nice smooth transition all the way down to the settled voltage. It took 22.5 milliseconds to get from 12 volts down to basically 0.04 and uh, basically no undershoot there. So that seems to be relatively good. We are seeing a slight discrepancy between the current set point and the actual current that's achieved, uh, but it's not too far out. So I think that's basically all of the operational details of um, the current and voltage setting. Let's have a look at some of the other features. Right, so in terms of other features on here, you can see we've got labelled M1 all the way up to M9, and these are some presets. So let's say we want to save this 5 volt and 6.1 amp setting. We can press MEM, and then let's say we want to store it in M3. Well, that's because if we want to do that, we can press Enter. 
And now we can go to, for example, M1, where I previously have already put 3.3 volts and a current setting of 0.01. So we could press enter and you can see it's gone to that setting. So that's quite handy to have up to uh, nine presets available there. Also, in the general purpose menu, we've got uh, a couple of settings associated with the communications, but I'm going to cover that in a separate video because I've not uh, loaded the software onto the PC just yet. But the USB interface is just here. And as I said, there's a Wi-Fi interface to plug into the back. And the first two options are associated with checking that interface is working properly. There's an RTC, so you can set the time and date. And there is place for a coin cell to retain that when you remove power. Also, you can turn off the beeper, which is what I've done now, because uh, the beeper is quite loud on this. And there is also a splash screen when you first turn on the device. You can change the backlight and also change the language. Let's go along to the next screen. And you can see on the main screen, you can either output voltage, current and power, or you can have sort of an oscilloscope view. Then you've got another way of setting all of the presets. So this is a little bit more of a visual uh, method of doing it if you want to do it quite quickly. And then finally, we've just got the model number. So this is the RD6006 and it's got version 1.25 of the firmware. So I think that's about it for the device for now. Let's have a little look at the PCBs on the rear of the unit. Right, so I've managed to separate the two halves of the power supply. Essentially, we've got sort of the power board and then we've got the control PCB. So what we've got on here is an ARM STM32 processor, which seems to be a really common type of processor to use these days. It's quite a powerful device and has quite a lot of peripherals on it. We've got a bit of uh, flash memory and also some FRAM. One of these um, Chinese chips that does the interfacing with all of the buttons. So that's a bit like one of the um, Titan micro chips that I used on some of the projects to drive the seven segment displays. This one's specifically designed for reading in matrix of switches. We've got a little bit of circuitry at the bottom here, just associated with the USB interface, but the STM32 has a USB interface built in. Uh, and then there's just a few bits like some FRAM and some flash and the interface off to the graphic LCD. So not a huge amount going on on here. Then we've got the actual power supply board itself and it's based around a TL594 PWM controller. So this is uh, quite an old school device actually. I remember using one of these about 15 years ago uh, to do some PWM control of some lights. And basically this is a switch mode power supply chip but everything is inside it is sort of quite modular. So you can use as much or as little of the functionality as you like and you can add in functionality yourself by adding circuitry around it like they have done on here. And it allows, I think it's controlled up to about 150 kilohertz. So the switching frequency is relatively low. So we're not gonna get the highest efficiency necessarily with this particular design because um, the switching frequency is a little bit low, even if they're running it at maximum. We have got another switch mode regulator here, but this is just uh, dropping down the potentially 70 volts from uh, the input here down to levels for the rest of the circuitry on all of the PCBs. On this side, we've actually got the switching device. So we've got a P-channel MOSFET here, and then uh, our freewheeling diode. Uh, so this is a twin diode in this TO220 package here, which is mounted onto the heatsink, which is also fan-cooled. And you can just about see a little temperature sensor that's sitting on the heatsink. And I think it says in the manual when it detects the temperature around 40 degrees, it starts spinning up the fan. So uh, it's got some thermal control. I don't know if it cuts out when it um, if it ever overheats or whether it can even overheat uh, with this fan that's fitted. There's not really that much else going on on here. So we've got a little ceramic fuse uh, protecting the outputs. We've got the relay which physically turns on and off the output. So you've got that button on the front of the device and it physically disconnects the banana jacks. And I did notice that when connected up to the oscilloscope, when you press the power button uh, on the front, it actually, uh, you get you know, a completely zero signal out from the uh, banana jacks on the front of the device. So pretty straightforward, really. There's not a huge amount going on. The TL594 actually has the reference built in. So it's got a 1% reference in there, which is where it's getting its accuracy from. It's certainly not uh, the most accurate uh, voltage reference and therefore most accurate um, 
controller that you could get but it looks like they've done some calibration points along the way which means that uh, we get quite good performance over the entire 0 to 60 volt output range. So um, there's also a probe here uh, which you can attach. I think it came with a, uh, a temperature probe actually. We've got one in a little packet here. And I think the idea is that basically if you've got this in the case with another power supply providing the 70 volts, you can then have this poked into that power supply just so that you can view the temperature of that. And um, it does show the temperature of that temperature sensor on the bottom here. It scrolls through a few different parameters on the display. So I think that's about all there is really to the design. I'm not going to go any more in depth. It's basically just a standard book regulator circuit that's um, able to drive quite a high output current due to the P-channel MOSFET that's being used. So uh, nothing that extraordinarily um, interesting going on here. So that's a little look at the Raiden RD6006 DC power supply. And overall, I think it's really quite a nice device. So it comes in at quite a decent price. And even if you factor in to the fact that you have to buy a case and an AC to DC power supply, depending on your application, it's still coming in at a fairly decent price in comparison to what else is on the market. So it seems to have really quite good functionality. The user interface is fine. I haven't really got too many complaints about that. There's probably a few tweaks that could be made, uh, but nothing that's really a showstopper. The only problem for me really is that it's not doing the voltage sensing at the terminals here. So we saw under load, it was reading the correct voltage on the display, but if you actually put a meter on the output here, if you're drawing any current, it's already starting to drop. So at some point in the future, we might try and trace down those lines. I did have a quick look, but there wasn't anything obvious. Um, we will try and trace down those lines and see if we can get it to read properly because that is uh, you know a bit of a flaw really you want it to output the correct voltage at least on the terminals and if possible it would be nice to have the two terminals that you can use for remote sensing so that you can take into account the leads that you've got plugged into the front of the device but considering its price point um, you know, the other devices around here don't do that kind of functionality anyway. That's something you'd expect or something a little bit more professional. But there we go. So I hope you found this useful. If you've got any comments or questions, leave them in the uh, comments section below. And until next time, thanks for watching.